This would be our 10th installment in the series on the table of the Lord. Our text tonight is one that is attended with some difficulty, but it's not uh, insurmountable. A few cursory words in introduction to this to keep before us the nature of the Lord's table. There are things associated with this table that are conducive to meditation. That is, they lend themselves to that. There's some, not all things are, for the believer, are things to dwell on. There's some things you have to leave, <laughs> leave them, not pay attention to them. But this is this, these things are not some of them. Lord's Table, of course, has a great uh, field of thought in the death of Christ itself and all of the, all of the things involved in that. And the declaring of Christ's death. We declare Christ's death. So Christ's death is uh, a pivot uh, upon which a lot of things revolve. It's, a, it's like a hub that almost everything can be traced back. The, all the benefits that you have in Christ can be traced back to the death of Christ. The death of Christ and the cross of Christ, these are essential to sound doctrine. Amen. His death, of course, the scripture reminds us his death was a determined death. That is, he was destined to die when he came into the world. So it, it's, it's not like a tragedy. The death of Christ is not like, the, like a tragedy or the cutting short of a person's life. Jesus said this in Matthew 26, 24, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. Now, he could say that to these 12 disciples. He, you couldn't say that to the modern church. They, they would have no idea what you meant. If you were to say to the average Christian, Jesus went to die according as it was written. They, they wouldn't have any. They'd think you were talking about the Gospels that was written uh, uh -huh. to the prophecies. So that's a very significant phrase because the, uh, the prophets didn't like focus on the death itself. They would tell you the, the result of it or what caused it, but it, they didn't like develop the thought of what would accrue at that time. Also in uh, Luke 22:22, 22, 22, it said, "Truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined." So that's that's a stronger, yeah. stronger word still. I can tell you that if you uh, pass through trials that are difficult, and all of you have at some time. If you haven't, I mean you will. This will happen. You pass through things that are very difficult to pass through. It neutralizes them to think of them being determined. See, neutralizes the power of them. And they are determined. God is determined that after you've suffered a while, he'll establish strength and settle and perfect you, see. So they are, they are determined. So Christ's view is, death is viewed from this standpoint. And Peter, right out of the chute on the day of Pentecost, he declared this. He did it again in Solomon's temple, he declared this. And he declared it later to the Sanhedrin in Acts 5. And they, they hammered down on this that you did it, but God determined it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very central doctrine. And you, you read in, in, the, about, in the gospel that the death of Christ was the blood of Christ. You read about the blood of Christ, the blood was because the life of the flesh is in the blood. See. He, he cultured people to think of blood properly. The blood stands actually for the person. So if you, if you shed a person's blood, you've taken their life. So he's, he cultured people to think of the blood right. And then, he, then he, you think about his blood here. 
this is my blood, or that's what this background of statements about the blood. Jesus, for a while, forfeited his position with the Father. He was cut off. See, now this is not understood by a lot of people. A lot of people think that Jesus really didn't mean it when he said, why hast thou forsaken me? And there's, there's hot, hot debates about this. If you haven't heard it, it's just because you haven't talked about this very much. Because if you talk about this, someone will surface. In very church people we're talking about, someone will surface that will have trouble with God forsaking Jesus. They just can't quite accept that. But that's part of the blood of Christ. Amen. The blood stands for his person. He was yeah. cut off and it's at this table. And it was, uh, his blood was shed for many. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just, just a kind of an individual act that happened. It was, it was his blood was shed, even it was from the historical point of view, other people took his life but his blood was shed for many. That goes back to this determination that God would not separate himself from his son for one, two, three hundred, a thousand souls. Ha, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Man's not worth that much. Well, this is, this is not priest, but I'll tell you, it does need to be. There's been an overestimation of the worth of humanity yeah. was shed for many. Yeah. If there hadn't been many, it wouldn't have been shed. Yeah. That's just the way it is. Shed for many. And we learn from Luke twenty two twenty. This is all these are all statements made the night he instituted this table. It was shed for many for the remission of sins. This is the only way God could get rid of your sin. Mm -hmm. It couldn't like be spoken away. Yeah. Be gone, sin. It wasn't, <laughs> no, no, it wasn't that way at all. Sin had to be gathered together into one place and the hammer of divine wrath come down upon it. Amen. That's bloodshed for the remission of sins. That's how it relates to Christ Jesus. And we... It's personal. This is my blood, Paul, Jesus said in Luke 22, 20, shed for you. So see, it says, oh, it's personal, very personal. Shed for you. Shed for all in one sense. Shed for many in the standpoint of comparing, comparing how many fell by Adam or how many redeemed by Christ and personal for you. At this table, you learn about the body of Christ. The body of Christ had more worth in the tomb than it did when he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So there are people that extol the life of Christ. Well, and it should be extolled because it was a marvelous life, a life of revelation. But the life of Christ that saves is not the life when he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. It's the life that he got when he rose from the dead. Amen. The body of Christ that is the resurrection body. And we read about the new new covenant. This is the my blood of the New Testament, the new covenant. That's all at this table. I'm mentioning things at this table. And there's the coming of the Lord till he come again. That's here at the here at the table. And as our text tonight says, there's the Father's kingdom. That's involved here. I'll not eat, drink of this cup of, until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So that's connected with this table. And there's a, there are some sobering realities associated with this table. Self-examination. It had best be thorough. Let a man examine himself. It better not be cursory. A person has to learn in Christ to give look at his life with a one grand overview versus yesterday and last year and when I was a teenager. He has to learn to capture the the entirety of his 
of his life with one purveying view. Examine himself. How in life have you fared <laughs> to this point? So you examine yourself and you will find every time that you will come out concluded, I need a savior. That every time you examine yourself, you come out with this. You're not saying, well, I don't need a savior today. I've done pretty good today. I've grown in grace and I haven't had any really serious expressions of sin. That's not what he's talking about when he says examine yourself. This blood was shed for you, so examining yourself, you've got to somehow come to the conclusion you needed this blood. You needed this Savior. It's got, you've got to come up to that conclusion. I say that because otherwise you'll say, is there anything in me tonight that shouldn't be there? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, there, we don't rule that out, but that's not the overall. You've got to examine yourself to see that this kind of Savior that is represented at this table is precisely the kind of Savior I needed. Amen. And I still need it. I still need this kind of Savior. Some people examine themselves and think, well, I'm a member of the right church. I'm going to be, everything's going to be okay. I've adopted the right creed. I'll be all right. No, this is a sobering reality of self-examination. Here's the sobering reality that it's the possibility that as you eat this, that you will incur judgment from God because of what you did at this table. Well, that's a sobering reality, isn't it? We judge ourselves, we should not be judged. It's about this table. I know, I believe that so, this happens and people are blissfully unaware of it that they actually heap judgment on their head because they ate at this table. And Jesus doesn't give you any option not to eat at this table. So like you're backed in a corner, you've got to eat at this table. Do this, Jesus said. He didn't say, if you feel as though you, it's the appropriate time, and if you feel as though you haven't done it too much, and you do this. But you've got to do it right or it will work against you. That's, that's a sobering reality. And the thought of being, it being possible to be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. If you eat and drink, it's unworthy. You're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That means on the record, it's recorded that you murdered Jesus. That's how the record will read next to the name of people who did this. This person murdered Jesus. Guilt, that's what guilty of the body and blood, that's what that means. Just as surely as when Paul consented to the death of Stephen, this person consented to the death of Christ. Not for remission of sin, not that. So see, it's sobering realities associated with this table. Now our text is at the table. Things have been proceeding along through the evening. And he says to his disciples, I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth, that's from now on, of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Hmm. Well, that, uh, <laughs> that's quite a statement. Here's how the account reads, that in that, in, as they did eat, he said, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. So he's there, Judas is there at the time. And they were exceedingly sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall Betray me, the Son of Man goeth, as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been better for that man that he had not been born. That's a statement that preceded this, this remark that he gave. Luke, in his version, said one, one of them would, would betray him. 
would betray him. Now the point we're doing is what prepared for this statement that Jesus made. I won't eat this anymore. Of this, he said, I will not eat of this blood, I will not drink of this blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. I won't, I won't drink of this from this point on. What he's saying in a nutshell is that something new is beginning here tonight. There's something that's going to fade out of you. I'm not going to drink this fruit of the vine. See, something's going to fade out of you at this point, and you will know that the Passover it like faded away. Because when anything new comes in, the old fades away. This is true of the new covenant. As soon as the new covenant come in, the old starts to fade away. As soon as Jesus laid down his life, there's a whole lot of things begin to diminish and fade away. This is the last time that we'll meet like this, Jesus is saying. We're never again going to meet like this. Yeah. Peter and John, you'll never prepare another Passover. Yeah. It's ended now. Passover lamb we're talking about. When they prepare the Passover, it was a Passover lamb. It was not going to be like this anymore at all. This is the blood of the New Testament. Well, the New Testament, it can't be enforced while the Old Testament is in force. It's just, it can't be. I'm not going to drink of it anymore now. See, he introduced all these thoughts to prepare them for something different. This is going to be different after this night. A greater, there's going to be a greater deliverance than from Egypt. It's going to be so great we're not going to remember the deliverance. We're going to remember the deliverer. Yeah. Israel remembered the deliverance. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. They didn't have the Passover recollection of Moses, did they? They didn't remember the deliverer. They remembered the deliverance. As I, I'm never going to, we're not going to be, cel I'll not be celebrating any kind of deliverance with you anymore. It's going to be a new, new covenant, a greater deliverance, greater blood, so forth. I'm not going to drink of this fruit of the vine until, until that day. All right, now at this point, this, this becomes a thorny little passage, and people for hundreds of years have talked over this. What exactly is he talking about? And most people have concluded that he's talking about when, we, when we're in heaven. And I don't question that there'll be some kind of recollection some of, of this in heaven. But is that what he's saying here? Until that day, that day. Now that phrase, that day, that's used a variety of ways in Scripture. For instance, in Matthew 7.22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? So that is a day of judgment, see, it's that day. Again, uh, the new covenant is cited as, as that day. Matthew 26, 27, he took the cup and gave it to them, and gave it to them, saying, This cup is the blood of the new covenant, is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And there he, he associates this blood with the testament that day. In Mark 13:32. He associates that day with his coming, again. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. So there, the, that day is the coming of the Lord. Yeah. The question is, is that the day he's talking about here? Reference to the time when he would, when they would suffer for Christ. He refers to that, that time. 
Luke 6, 23. Rejoice in that day. This is what after he told them they were going to haul them into the synagogues and kill them. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. But in John, that day is associated with after he rose from the dead. John 14, 29 says, And at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. What day is he talking about? He's not talking about when you get to heaven. He's not talking, he's not talking about some other day of judgment. In that, that's, that's what after he rose from the dead, they were going to see him again, and he appears back about that period of time. John 16, 22, he takes it a little, a little further. For now, therefore, ye have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day, there it is again. In that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily I say unto you, whosoever, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you, and so forth. Now, some people have thought that what, that what this must mean is when he ate and drank with, with them after he rose from the dead. Now, he did this when he met with the disciples. Remember, he, he said, give me, what, give me some bread, he ate, he ate it. Give me some fish, and he ate it. And then when he met with the disciples on the shore, he ate for them. Some people said, that's what he's talking about. When he, when he ate, what, see, he went, but this isn't the Lord's table. That isn't right. what he was talking about then. So it is after he rose. But it's not before he went to heaven. There's no account that Jesus partook the Lord's table with his disciples before, after he rose from the dead and before he went to heaven. So when is this, uh, when is this talking, what is this talking about? Well, it's talking about the era of the new covenant. Now that night he talked to them about things like this. So I want to, I want to focus on that. John 14 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I, I will not leave you comfortless. I will yet a little while, and, and the world seeth me no more, but you will see me, because ye live, I shall live also in that day. That's then after the Holy Spirit's come. It's after Jesus died, after he ascended, after the Holy Spirit came. In that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. They didn't know that till Jesus went back to heaven. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, so forth. So it's that, that's the day he's talking about. Amen. That day. It's the day after he died, mm -hmm. after he ascended into heaven, after the Holy Spirit came, there's illumination. That's the day, that day, that's the days that he's talking about. Until that day. Mm -hmm. Well, how, why would he speak of some other time after he'd been building up? Uh -huh. Been building up to this and his discussion with his disciples and the revelation been given to him. He'd been building up, preparing him for he's going to go away and want to go away. Well, you'll see me again. You'll see me again. I'll not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yeah. So, and, and the Holy Spirit will be, will be the comfort. I'll, be, I'll come in the person of the Spirit with you, and I'll be with you. Why would he say all that only to say, and when you get to heaven, I'll take the Lord's Supper with you? This to me doesn't make sense. I can't envision sitting at this table without Jesus being there too. I'll drink it new with you. And it won't be like it is tonight. I'm not going to drink this cup. See, first he drank it, then he gave it to them. It's not going to be like this. It's going to be a different kind of drinking, different kind of cup. Everything's going to be new. This is where I, why at the Lord's table it speaks of it as communion. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the communion of the body, the communion of the blood, is because of the presence of Christ mm -hmm. Not just the work of Christ. Well, that, that's, uh, Jesus showed himself alive to John in the Isle of Patmos. He said, I am he that was dead, and I am alive forevermore. Uh -huh. that's, 
That's the Jesus that's here. Yes, amen. Drinking this new with us. He's participating us not within the physical action like he did on the night of his betrayal. He's participating with us in the communion of the blood and the communion of the body. Yes. Or the fellowship of the blood, the fellowship of the body. Yes. You can't participate in the body and blood of the Lord without the Lord being there and involved in it. <coughs> so it's not, he's not going to be with them as one who was going to die. That night he was going to die. <coughs> he's not going to be with them in that sense. He's going to be with them in the sense of I died and I'm alive forevermore. And as in any ordinance and any facet of spiritual life, it is the presence of Christ that vitalizes the subject. Amen. That's what puts life in it, yes. is the presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. Doctrine, as necessary as it is, does not dispense life. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am the life. So right. no Jesus, no life. Right. It can't be that Jesus sends like a little lightning bolt down from heaven and as it represents him, it's not like that. Jesus is here. He told him, he said, I am with you even to the end of the world. But he didn't leave, he doesn't leave heaven to do that. The first, at this table that we're reading about, he left heaven to participate in this, but he's still in heaven, but, he, but he's with us too. What the scripture would call omnipresent. John saw him on the Isle of Patmos, <clears throat> but he, heaven, he didn't vacate heaven to appear to John in all of his glory. He didn't, he didn't leave the right hand of God. When, when Jesus met Saul of Tarsus, that was really Jesus, but Jesus didn't leave heaven to be a Saul of Tarsus any more than God's glory when it appeared to Moses. Heaven wasn't empty for a while of God. I'll drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. See, valid preaching, I'm very interested in valid preaching. Valid preaching makes people keenly aware of Christ. Amen. Not only what he's, who he is, what he's done, but the fact that he dwells in his people. They've been joined unto the Lord and are one spirit with him. And to a people like that, this means something. Amen. I'll drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In my Father's kingdom? Well, some people believe that that kingdom hasn't come yet. Yeah. That, they say, is the millennial kingdom. When Jesus was going to come, set up his throne in Jerusalem, and he's going to reign. You'll be able to get on Southwest Airlines or American Airlines and fly over there. See, this is taught now by virtually everybody that's talking about this subject. Some people free themselves by not talking about this subject. I'm going to drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's what Mark, Mark says, I'll, till I drink it in the kingdom of God. That's how he said it. Same thing. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 16, 28, he's getting the disciples ready now for his departure. He said, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Some of you standing right here. So the coming of his kingdom, this wasn't talking about a millennial kingdom, but yeah. toward the close of time. This is speaking about when God fulfilled the word of Daniel, the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It's the kingdom of his father, the kingdom of God, but God has delivered it over to Christ. So it's, it's called the kingdom of Christ, of God and of Christ. So 
it's, it's not so much that they're co-regents, it's that God, it's God's kingdom, but he's delivered it over to Jesus. And part of his kingdom activity is to participate with his people at this table. <laughs> Did I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom? Some of you not, are not going to die. James, you're going to die early on, but not till you see the kingdom of God come. It come with power. This accounts for the proclamation of the kingdom of God. Jesus said, if I with the finger of God cast out devils, he said, the kingdom of God's come to you. John the Baptist, he went out preaching, the kingdom of God is near. Jesus said, preaching the kingdom of God, it was it's at hand. Well, he wasn't talking about a second coming or something, throne set up in Jerusalem. He's talking about when God in an unprecedented way, come and dwelt with men without regard to sin, which was dealt with. He dwelt with men in su such a closeness and intimacy that, is, that had never before been experienced by men. And in that kingdom, Jesus participates with us in his table. I don't see a person can get away from this. I don't want to get away from it. This accounts for the proclamation of the kingdom of God. And of course... There are many in the apostolic doctrine, there's many references to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God. So as we sit at this table, there's a sense in which we're in the kingdom of God. Kingdom of the Father. This is a kingdom activity. And as we're here... At this table, there's some sense in which I, I, don't, I can't say much more than this, but in some sense, he's here mm -hmm. drinking this with us. Because yeah. the death of Christ means a lot to Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's not something that, well, I, thank God that's passed now. Thank God this is established. This has established a union between God and man. This has inducted a new covenant in which I can drink with my disciples. In a sense, I, I couldn't drink with them like this before because they didn't realize what we were doing. What I say, you know not, he told them that night. You don't understand. He told them about being washed. They didn't, they didn't pick up on it what it was. Before they died, they'd picked up on it. Ephesians 5.5 5 reminds us about this relationship of the kingdom to God and Christ. Ye know that, to who, that, to, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous person, not covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of, God, of Christ and of God. See, so it's a, say the kingdom of God, this is the same as the kingdom of Christ. Jesus Christ is the governor of it at this present time, the king of it. And in the end, of course, the scriptures tell us he's going to hand it back yeah. to the Father. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. this is a kingdom activity at this table. You can know more about Christ than anyone in other ages knew mm -hmm. at this table. Amen. Now you think how much Jesus divulged the night of his betrayal, John 13 through 18 through 17, all the things he told them, and you know more than that. Right. You tap into more knowledge than he told them about washing, and he told them about the Holy Spirit, and he told them about him going to the Father, and he, 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 he expounded a number of things in his prayer. He talked a, a lot about them and their relationship to God and him and so forth. And you read that chapters 30 through 7, you say, well, this is a lot. This is a lot of information, but there's more at this table. Yeah. Yeah. Those things are all opened up. If you think the first time Jesus ate this with his disciples, that he divulged a lot. You ought to see what he divulges now. 
I'm going to drink it new, new with you. See, is after he drank it, that's when he kind of began to open, open things up. So I take it that when he says he drink it new with my with you in my father's kingdom, he was speaking about that day when he had ascended back to the Father. His work completed. The Holy Spirit had come, and Jesus had come with him. I will, I will, I will send him to you and then he says I will I will come <clears throat> comes in the person of the spirit and he comes to participate at this table with his people now for for people that are persuaded that of infrequency at this table I mean I don't I don't know how you could process this in view of this text I don't know how you could process something like that that once a year or once a quarter or once a month Jesus Meets with it. I don't know how you'd process that. It seems to me that this tells us that Jesus wants to be with his disciples regularly, and and there are like peak, peak times when like you're like Moses, he climbed up the Mount Sinai to get closer to God. This table is like like a mountain in a, a it's like a mount among a, in a mountain range. See, in the scripture, a mount, there'd be a, a mountain range, and there'd be this mount that, that's what this table is, like a mount. Jesus doesn't have to descend so far when you're, when you're on that mount. And he'd, uh, he drinks it new with us. Why, why did he say blood? Why didn't he say body? Why didn't he, because the blood is the blood of the Testament. His body's not the body of the New Testament. The blood ratified or put into force the new covenant. So that's why he mentioned this. He mentioned the blood versus mentioning the body and the blood. He mentioned the blood because the blood was the covenant ratification or seal. In other words, when Jesus drinks this fruit of the vine with us at this table, he fortifies the thought of the uh, new covenant and the effectiveness of the new covenant and the glory of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. That this is a very real association that we have with God. This is not just a, an ordinance, a lifeless ordinance. It's not, it's not like that at all. There's, Jesus is here, and we're, we're doing this in the kingdom of the Father, see? And we're doing this by the Holy Spirit, that will help your mind process. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit, one of his works is to help us think better. Yeah. Amen. He can bring up things that are more profitable to think about. And it happens at this table, and Jesus is drinking with us. See, this is a, well, I can't, I, I'm just dissatisfied with how I'm able to say this, but you can make a lot of progress at this table. Because the Holy Spirit's here, God's here, Jesus is here. And in the recollection, there's like a, a surge of life that comes to you. And uh, I surely wish I could have done better on this subject. This, this is, is a, it is a challenging text, but it's good. What Plow and I did is really good. <laughs> Really good, and uh, perhaps you will be able to open up even more to it, more of it to us. Brother Aaron will have our exhortation.